Amen. So you have your Bible with you tonight. I'd like you to open it to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And while you're going there, I thought I'd refresh your memory a little bit. This morning we heard about the Red Sea parting and Moses. So I thought I'd talk a little just for a second about Noah. Since we're talking about building, you know, God called Noah to build, right? He gave him a word. He said build, right? And he was going to build an ark. And we often think about the fact that as people watched Noah build this ark, they had no idea what he was doing. They had no idea why he would build an ark in a wilderness, in a desert place, when it had never even rained. How would this ark, this boat, ever get to the ocean, to the water? It made no sense what he was doing. But, but Noah was acting in obedience. He was building because God told him to build, not because he understood it. And I think sometimes we forget that. Right? I don't think that Noah understood the full redemption plan of God. I don't think that Noah understood exactly what God was going to do to make it all work out. But he was acting out of obedience. And you know, when God calls us to build and he calls us to do anything in the kingdom of God, it's always out of obedience. You know, it's always out of you said it, I'm going to do it. Not because I get it, not because I understand it, not because I can figure it out. Because if we wait for that, we're not going to do anything. How many of you were here this morning? You saw the video, right? She, she, she couldn't figure out how Jesus would catch her. What happened? She chose not to fall backwards, right? Because she couldn't figure it out, and that stops us so many times. And God's invitation to us is just to obey, right? Just to obey. He's going to do the rest. He's going to fill in all the gaps and make it work, right? So Noah was a builder in obedience, right? And I think God has called us to also be builders tonight. So I want to start our, our conversation tonight in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18, it says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Let's go backwards a little bit and give you a little bit of context. This was the moment when Jesus was with his disciples, and he was asking them, he was saying, Who do men say that I am? Right. What's the word out there? What are they believing about me? And the disciples began to give a various responses but then in that moment God intervenes in the conversation and he drops this revelation into Peter's spirit and Peter all of a sudden out of his mouth and probably without understanding even what he says right he says you are the Christ the son of the living God you are the anointed one you are God's son and Jesus recognizes that that wasn't from Peter that had come straight from God so this is an amazing moment this is a moment for the first time that the identity of Jesus is recognized in their midst they actually get to hear who this man is they've been walking with, who this rabbi, this teacher is, and all of a sudden it's proclaimed. And I think that's so unique because right after that, right after that, Jesus says this, you told me my name, you recognize who I am, and I also say to you that you're Peter. He told Simon, you're Peter. Then he goes on to say, and on this rock, I will build my church. He is just been identified as the anointed one, the son of the living God. And the first thing he says he's going to do is build his church. Central idea, important theme. Jesus is telling us how important the church is. So tonight, there's so many things in the scripture we could talk about. I just want to talk about those five words. I will build my church. Right? Just want to talk about those few things. So what do you think of when you hear the word church? Depends what your background is, Right? Depends what you're used to. Maybe you're new tonight and you've never even been in a church before and you're visiting. And when somebody says the word church, you think of a, a clan, a creed, right? A clique, a religion. Some, some strange thing, you don't really know what it is. Right? Maybe when somebody says the word church, you, you were brought up to think of a cathedral, a basilica, right? Something, some building, a sanctuary, some shrine. We can come at it from a lot of backgrounds about what the church means. The word of God gives us some definitions of the church as the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the chosen ones, the called out assembly, the sons and daughters of God, right, the redeemed, the righteous, all of those are terms that describe the church. What I'd like to do tonight is think of the church as simply a place where you come to find God. Actually, that's not, but that is another reason that we come to church. Right, maybe that's you tonight. 
You don't know anything about the definitions of church. All you know is that you needed God. All right? And you found your way here somehow. Somebody invited you. Or you came tonight, you know, normally come on a Sunday night, and you're like, you know what, I just need God. I, I know that at that place that I can have an encounter with God. Well, you've already had one tonight, and I think as you tune in, you're going to continue to have one. God's got something for you. He's delivered it to you, and he's going to continue to do so tonight. So what I do want to say, though, I want to give a very simple explanation, definition of the church tonight that I want us to work from just for this message. I'd like to propose that the church is a people called out to bless the world in Jesus' name. The church is a people called out to bless the world in Jesus' name. And I mean, if you look around you and you look at what we're doing here at this church, it's an incredible example of that, right? I mean, even if you only came to services, you're blessed in Jesus' name. You're blessed by the atmosphere created for you to encounter God. You're blessed by the word that's prepared and, and studied and, and broken up and served to you every time you come. But what we do here is actually a very small part of what the Rock Church is doing and what the church is doing. We feed people, we go out on missions, we go into the highways and the byways, we take it to the street, we go to the jails, right? All of that is blessing the world in Jesus' name. And that's what the church does. You know, Jesus started the whole thing when he came. We just had Easter last week. We celebrated the life, the death, the victory over death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the, the manifested, manifested presence of God, right? Jesus is God, 100% God, but he, he wrapped himself in humanity. He became the incarnation, right? He took God and flesh, right? He took flesh. He, God took on flesh, right? But when he died and he resurrected and then he ascended, that incarnation process didn't stop. He chose to continue the incarnation process through people, to continue having the good news of Jesus Christ, the power and the authority, the gospel spread and contained in human beings, normal everyday people like you and me. He was the chief cornerstone. He came and he, he put that cornerstone into place so that everything would be measured against it and it would be right. And then he gave us apostles and the prophets, right, to lay a foundation to lay a foundation so that the church would be built on something that's solid and true based on the, the love and the life of Jesus Christ. So he said, I will build my church, and that's how it began. It began with his life. He came and he laid it down and became our cornerstone from which he was building his church. But the thing is, when we think about the church, when I think about the church and we see people, we recognize our frailty. We recognize our inability. We recognize that we are fragile, weak, just everyday normal people. Yet God chose to put his supernatural, amazing, wonderful power, authority, presence in us so that we could give it to other people. What an incredible thought. I mean, he, he could have chosen angels. You know, Jesus could have said, I did it, I established it, right? I paid the price for the good news, and now I'm going to send legions of angels, and they're going to wander the earth, and they're going to tell everybody about the freedom that's available to them should they so choose. That would have been amazing, yeah? That's a plan we would have thought of, right? But, but God didn't. God chose, and chose to use broken, simple, mundane, normal, fragile humanity. It tells us in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, I'm reading it there at a New Living Translation. I think it's up on the screen. It says, now we have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. He knew from the beginning that he was going to put his great treasure in jars of clay. You know, when a jar of clay falls, it breaks. It's fragile. It's fragile. But God said, you know what? They're my imagers. They're the ones who were created in my image and likeness. And, and I'm going to put my power and my authority, this great news, this exceeding great power inside of them. That was his choice. The church is his design. It's his choice. It's something that he loves. And so tonight I want us to see that the church are the people around you. The church is 
the congregation. The church is the people you pass walking in the hallway. The church is the people you drop your children off to or you buy a coffee from or that greet you in the parking lot or that greet you at the doors or sit next to you every week in service who you haven't actually really met. You're just like, hey. Right? That's the church. That's a carrier of the kingdom of God. That's a carrier of the power, the greatness, the shining light in our hearts. They have that same presence of God that you have as part of the church. And I think we have to see that sometimes. We have to remind ourselves that I am in the midst of the church. God's choice for his presence. God's design for his goodness on the earth. How amazing is that? How incredible and miraculous is that so it was God's choice he chose us to carry his presence to deliver his gospel and that's what makes us his church he started the building with himself he laid a foundation with the apostles and the prophets right and then he tells us in first Peter 2 5 first Peter 2 5 they'll put it on the screen for you I have it there the, the new living translation I think or maybe not it says this I'll read it to you are you and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. God is building us living stones into his spiritual temple. The New King James Version says it like this. We are being built up as a spiritual house. So Jesus said, I will build my church. And he's in the process of building us as his spiritual house. So how is he building it? Right? He builds... We get built up by this, right, by the word of God, by the word of God. In 2 Peter 2.2, 2, it tells us to desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The word of God, first and foremost, that's how we're going to grow, right? The word of God, we put it in us, we desire it, we get strength from it, we get knowledge from it, we get wisdom from it, right? Jesus is the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we're partaking, we're communing with Jesus as we learn the word, as we study the word, as we chew the word, as we spend time in the word. God is growing us and as he's growing us, he's growing his church. Right? Because each one of us are individually members of that body, which is the church. Yeah. How else is he growing us? Well, Jesus gave us some gifts. He gave us some gifts for our growth when he ascended. The Bible says that when he ascended on high, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11, 12, it tells us that he himself gave some, gave, it was a gift, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Next. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And another word for edifying means building up. Right, so he gave us these gifts, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, so that we could come and learn and receive, and we do that. Every time we gather together, right, we hear a word from our pastors, from teachers, from apostles, from prophets. We hear this word, and it equips us, and it builds us up, and how wonderful that is. I mean, in this day and age we live, there's no excuse not to grow. I mean, there are books, there are tapes, there are podcasts, there are CDs. You can listen to every rock message for I don't know how many years back on the website, right? There's an abundance of goodness out there for us to grow from. But here's the thing, that both of those can allow us to do them without a huge effort on our part. We can come and sit, be like, oh, good food. Thanks for preparing that for me. Open the word and read and read and enjoy and enjoy it and spend time with Jesus. And that's good. But that's all about us. But it, it's not just the responsibility of a past, apostles, pastors, teachers, prophets, pastors, evangelists to grow the church. It's our job too. That's why the title of tonight's message is Be a Builder. Be a builder because God has called us to participate in this process of building the church. It's not something that we do passively. It's something that we do actively. It's something that he wants us to be involved in to build the church. So I want to spend some time tonight in Ephesians chapter 4 starting at verse 14. So if you have your Bible, you can open it there. We'll be there for a while. Breaking apart and looking at our responsibility because I think what this tells us is that the church builds the church.
It says that we should no longer be children. He wants us to grow up. He didn't call us and set us apart and give us his spirit and give us his power so that we would stay the same. Because this is what happens to children. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Right? Things come our way. And, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that's a new belief. Oh, maybe they're right. Oh, let me go. And everything trips us up. Somebody tells us something contrary to what we thought we believed and we're not sure. A kid believes everything they tell them, right? They just fall into it. I mean, they believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. and Why? Because they're kids, right? And it's fun and they believe those things, but we got to grow past that, right? So the apostle is saying, hey, 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 no longer be children because you can't just be tossed to and fro. You need to be grounded and solid. I mean, how would you like to go house shopping, and you're driving down the street and you're looking at these houses and this house is like, it kind of not, not standing very steady, right? It, it looks like it's a little shaky. Maybe it has the greatest foundation ever, but nobody ever put time into building it very well. Would you say, hey, I'm going to put, put a bid on that house? No, right, you'd run away from that house, right? Why? Because it's not standing solid. We have to grow up, right? Because when you drive by and you go house shopping, you know what people see? They see the house. They don't see the foundation. That foundation can be as solid as possible. But they go and they look at the house. They look at the windows and the roof and how pretty it looks. And what, do the, what does the greenery look on the outside? That's what catches the attention, right? Jesus is building us so that we can draw people to that foundation so they can also be built on it. So it's, we need to be active about that. We need to be aware of that so that we'll contribute our part. So that we'll be a builder. So let's go on to verse 15. It says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So I want to take some time and break that apart a little bit for us tonight, all right? Let's go ahead and dive into what is this no longer children but growing up. I would propose to you tonight that the church is built when we speak up. Verse 15 says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ, speaking the truth in love. We have to realize what the truth is, and we get that all the time. We sit in services, we open up the word, we get filled with that truth, right? The word of God tells us that all things are created new, right? And when we come into Jesus, everything has been made new. So there's a whole bunch of truth there that's true about us. We can go anywhere in the word of God and find some wonderful truth that we could begin to speak. The one I want to look at tonight is 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 about some truth about us. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, it says, But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I mean, that's a lot of truth. That's a lot of goodness. Let's also read verse 10. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. You and I were once scattered abroad, living our own life, self-centered, engulfed in our own decisions, right? I came to know Christ at 16, but I can tell you I was a mess before then. Self-centered, wanting my own way, not liking the world around me, rebellious to the core, right? On my own agenda, having done horrible things even at that young age, right? But I'll tell you what, at that point, Jesus came and rescued me and he said, you are not a people, but now you are a people. Now I'm adding you to this church. Now you're going to be part of this body. And I have some good things about this people. This people, they're chosen. They're royal. They're set apart, right? That's who we are. So there's a lot of truth that we can speak to one another. There's a lot of goodness about 
what we are, what we wouldn't used to be, right? We've now had mercy that we didn't have before, right? We're in a whole new place, and so there's a lot of truth that we can speak to one another. So we know that we're chosen, that we're royal, that we're special, that we're called, that we've been brought together as a people. But you know what? It's not just us. It's our neighbor too. It's the people sitting around us. It's those in church tonight who, who've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who said, yeah, I'm in part of that family. They're also the people of God. And we can turn and we can remind each other of those things. You know, that's why I love on a, on a Sunday morning and Pastor Jim tells us to turn around and look at the person next to you and tell them you look good. Because you know what we're saying? You look like your father, right? right? You've been created in his image and likeness. All we're doing is speaking truth. And every time we speak truth, we build up the church. We build up the church. If we would speak up and declare and say the things that God says, the people around us would be built up. I didn't make that up. We just read it right there in Ephesians. Speaking the truth in love, you may grow up into all things. So that's our part. We got to learn to, to speak up so that the people around us can grow up, right? And God can continue to build his church, right? The next thing I want to propose to you that we can pick up out of Ephesians chapter 4 is that to build God's house, to build the church, we have to connect. Verse 16 says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Now I've thought about that word joint and, and there's a couple of ways that you can look at it. You can look at joint in what it is. Right? Joint in, its, in that word, you describe a joint, right? something that connects two pieces together. Or you can look at its function. The function of the joint is to connect. And when you actually look back at the Greek of that word, you don't know Greek, I don't speak Greek either, but what it means is connection, which every connection supplies. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every connection supplies. If you look at the, the meaning of that word, it means to fasten oneself to, to fasten oneself to, to adhere, to cling. Simply put, to be together, to be together. I remember being interested in just kind of amazed by the scripture in Ephesians as, as a young believer. Ephesians 5.19 says, you know, speaking to one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melodies in your heart to the Lord. I got that part, the singing and making melodies in your heart to the Lord. I could do that, right? Nobody hears me. I can sing as loud as I want, right? I'm good at that. But it was the first part that kind of was a mystery to me, right? Speaking to one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. It wasn't until later that I realized that the, the importance of us being together so that we could speak to one another so that God could grow his church, so he could build his church, right? We have to be together so that we can speak to one another the things that God says so that we can grow up and be what God has called us to be. Let's take a look at an example of this in 1 Corinthians. Paul is talking about himself and Apollos. Right, and Paul writes to the church there at Corinthians, he said, I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. Here's the deal. Paul is telling them it's not about Apollos and I. It's not about who does the planting and who does the watering, but you know what? Something had to get planted and something had to get watered. He's not saying that's not important. What he's saying is it doesn't matter who does it because God is there waiting and willing to give the increase. But you know what? God needs something to work with. That's why the word tells us that he blesses the work of our hands and everything we do it shall prosper because he's right there behind it, breathing on it, waiting for us to do something. Right? And so he calls us to be together. I'm sure Paul and Apollos had to be together with the church. They had to go to the church. You hear Paul saying all the time, I long to be with you so that I may impart 
some spiritual gift. I may impart something to you. He wanted to be together because it's that joining together that allows God to build his church. We have to connect with each other. You know, I met somebody here in church a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so, and uh, I didn't know her name, introduced myself, and we were just walked up and said hi. I found out she's been part of The Rock over a dozen years. I never met her. And she said, I don't know anybody. I just come in, sit down in my seat, service is over, I get up and go. It's wonderful to come in and receive, receive the word, be in worship, hallelujah, give yourself, release everything to God, and then go out. But how much more wonderful to connect. How much more wonderful to turn and say to somebody and meet them and greet them and get to know them and get involved and make an opportunity to sign up and say, today they had a connect table outside, right? You don't need a connect table to sign up. There's a volunteer section out there. You can go any day and say, you know what? I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to help grow the church. I'm ready to do my part. I'm ready to connect purposely so that God can use me to be part of growing up his church so I can do what Jesus is doing because Jesus is building his church. So, hey, sign me up. I want to do what Jesus is doing, right? I want to be part of what he's already doing. But in order to do that, we have to be together. We have to be together. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. God comes in and does what we can't do. But we have to do what we can do. And what we can do is put seed in the ground. What we can do is water one another by speaking words of life and declaring what God says over each other when we come in contact. And you know, that doesn't just happen right here in our midst. It can happen at home in your family. What are the words that are coming out of our mouth over our kids? What are the words that we're speaking to them when they go to school? What are the words, what are we declaring? Are we declaring life and growth and potential, right? Or a bunch of nonsense. Are we pointing out the obvious? You know, as a teacher, I always have two choices. When a student is not behaving the way they should, not doing what they need to do, I can point out the obvious or I can speak the truth. I can tell them, you're not doing what you're supposed to, but you know what, they already know that. Instead, I can say, I know that you can do this, right? I can do, I can speak their potential. I can speak to who God created them to be. I can speak to the fact that they are created in the image and, 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 and likeness of God. I can speak to that. I can choose to use those words to create life, or I can just do words that don't mean anything. And it's the same thing for us, right? We can do that same thing. That's why we have to speak up the truth so that we can grow. That's why we have to connect with one another so that we can bring forth. See, let's go on in this scripture to verse 8. It says, the one who plants and the one who waters work together, connect, right? We work together for the same purpose. And I like this. And both will be rewarded for their hard work. I mean, just a side note here. God doesn't reward things he doesn't place value on. He places value on that work. He places value on our connecting and our sowing seed and our watering each other. Not just coming in and it's all about me and I need God and that's all good. But it's better when we realize that the people around us need us and we need them. Right? It's better when we do it together so that we can grow up more effectively. And then we might, just, might as well read verse 9. It says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's Building, right? You are his building. God is building his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And we participate in that by speaking up, connecting with each other. And one final thing, we, we build God's church when we share ourselves. You have to share you. You have to be willing to share you. Ephesians 4 same thing, going on to verse 15, the second part, it says this, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Every part does its share. You know what that means? That means you matter. That means you're important. That means you have a share. That means God 
has already created things for you to do. And they are valuable. I need you. You need me too. We need each other to each do our part. So that the body of Christ can grow up to become everything that Jesus dreamt it to be and knows that it will be. That beautiful, gorgeous, stunning house that when you drive by, it's amazing and everybody wants to go to it. But it takes all of us doing our part. All of us sharing and being willing to give, right? We do that by serving. We do that by praying. We do that by giving financially, giving of our time, giving of our heart. There's so many opportunities to come and share yourself. But don't isolate yourself. Don't set yourself apart. Come and be a part. Be a part of the family, right? Be a part. Give because what you have, we need. Right? What you have, God has deposited on the inside of you. He's placed it there. It is a gift to my life. It is a gift to the people next to you. It is a gift to the house. What you have is God ordained, God deposited. He chose to incarnate the gospel, to put it in flesh, your flesh, so that you could share it with other people. You could bring his good news, right? A called out people. Blessing the world in Jesus' name. There's something in you for everyone around you. And if we're going to build the church, we have to be willing to share ourselves. So you might be saying, well, I'm leaving tonight. going to go home tomorrow, this week. What can I do? Let me just challenge you to, to lay hold of one thing. One thing that you can speak to somebody else. Maybe God will give you a verse. He'll pop one into your mind as you're driving home or as you've sat here tonight, something that resonates with you, and you decide you're going to speak that truth into your family. You're going to speak that truth to the people next to you, but maybe you're like, I don't know what to say. Let me just give you a couple of ideas. All right, something that maybe you can make your mantra this week as you come across the church of the living God in all aspects of what you do. Maybe it's your colleagues at work that are believers. Maybe it's your family members. Maybe it's when you walk on this campus on on Wednesday night or Thursday morning or Friday night or whenever you come across others. Here's the deal. If you know who you are, if you can lay hold of who you are in Christ, then you know who they are. If it's true about me, it's true about them. If it's true about me, it's true about you. If you're a child of God. So when I, all of these things I learned about my identity, like I'm a new creation in Christ, so are they. When they're discouraged and depressed and down and they don't understand what things are going around them, they can say, hey, I can say to them, hey, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Right? You can lay hold of that. Or or maybe here's another one. Maybe, Maybe you run across people who are just not sure they can do it. Just not sure about the next step, feeling a little discouraged. Maybe you can just remind them of something simple like, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ. You know that word of encouragement hits their spirit and it gives them grace. That's what, that's what the Bible tells us, that we can give grace. Our words give grace to the hearer, that as we speak, it actually empowers them to do what God has called them to do. How amazing is that? From one mouth to their heart, they're now empowered to go out and do what God has called them to do. That's how you build the church because you speak up, you connect, and you make yourself available to open and declare so that God's grace can fill them and they can go and do what God has called them to do. Building the church can be kind of easy if we're willing to forget about ourselves for a minute, right? If we're willing to set ourselves aside and just open our mouth and be with others and do what God has called us to do. I mean, maybe it can be something simple like reminding people that God is for them, that they're loved and they're treasured, right? That the light of the world resides in you, that you actually are the light of the world. So just turn to them and say, hey, go shine. Go shine this week. Go shine in your job. Go shine in your home. Go shine in the highways and byways. Go shine at your yoga class. Right? You can let them know that God has a wonderful plan for them because it's true, he does. The word tells us over and over again, right, that God has a plan for us, right? He knows the plans that he has for us. What does that mean? That means he has plans. Hello. Right? God's got some plans for us. 
We can remind them that they're amazing, that they're beautiful, that they look like their father, just like we do in this house every week. When we turn to somebody and we tell them, you look good, we're building the church. We're reminding each other of who we really are, that we actually are created in the image and likeness of our father. So if you don't know what to say, just say what God says. What he says about you, say about them. And you'll be doing your part to invest and build the church. Let's look back at that scripture all together out of Ephesians 4. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part, that's us, does its share, causes growth for the body, for the edifying, building up of itself in love. You play an important role in building the church. You are essential to building the church. We've got a perfect cornerstone. We've got a solid foundation. We've got the word of God that builds us. We've got the gifts of the fivefold ministry, and then we have each other. And working together, we're building his house. We're doing what Jesus is doing. I don't know about you, but that's what I want to be doing. Of anything else that I want to do in my life, that's what I want to do. I want to do what Jesus is doing because you know what? He doesn't waste his time. He knows what's important. He knows where the value is. He knows what's going to count into eternity long. And if I get to choose what I get to do with my time, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build his church.